truly, to be sitting here with both of you today. What does your toolbox look like that helps you sustain a healthy radical imagination? That whatever it is we might be going through today might not be what we are going through tomorrow. It still produces fruit because its roots are so deep and it's so big. So even in the harshest conditions with no water, it still ha is nourished. Hello! How are you guys? So happy you guys are here, truly. already jiggling. So first off, thank you all for being here. Um, the purpose and intention of this conversation today is to illuminate radical imagination and how to sustain love and joy in the midst of adversity and opposition. And there was no one better to have this conversation with other than Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and actor Kendrick Sampson. It's an honor, truly, to be sitting here with both of you today. Ilhan, you are a force, a prolific communicator, a courageous, fearless leader. You made history in 2019, becoming one of the first two Muslim Americans to be elected in Congress, and all while being a refugee, immigrant, a woman of color from Africa. Give it up, y'all, for that. Kendrick, you are a phenomenal actor, producer, abolitionist, activist. Some may know you from Vampire Diaries, others as Nathan from Insecure. <laughs> and a lot of people know you for your community work. You, as well, are a force. You are an advocate for change, an advocate for justice. Did either one of you see yourselves in the position that you're in today? <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> I was organizing at 14 years old. Uh, um, I, yes, but I also, I mean, as a child, I, I had a big imagination. Everything that I liked, I was gonna, I liked animals, so I was gonna be a veterinarian. I saw Jurassic Park, I was gonna be an archeologist. I thought I was going to be a doctor at some point. Then I realized I could play all of them. So, <laughs> there you, you know, go. it's a lot easier than going through school and stuff like that for each one. So I decided to be an actor. Boom. <laughs> I didn't here really we are see, today. But I will say that I always, 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 I don't know that I, I thought that I was going to be an activist necessarily, sure. but I did think that I was, I, I, I got, to watch a lot of you know Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Roots and a lot of that when I was I, I was made to watch it <laughs> you know I had to learn my history and um, and I always thought to myself well what was the outcome of all that mm. I'm like at some point we got to take it up you know some yeah. point in your life you have to it's probably going to be way because I thought Martin Luther King and them were like 60 70 you sure. know, <laughs> when they started. So, because, you know, they seem like old right. people when we're young. So I'm like, oh, when I'm 60, 70, maybe I'll stand up for somebody's rights. <laughs> so it came a little bit sooner than that. So. <laughs> well, praise, praise the lamb. What about you, Ilhan? Um, I, I, I didn't, actually. Um, you know, I, I always knew that um, I, I was raised to be active in society. Mm. Um, to care about not just myself, but everyone else that was around me, to critique systems, um, to try to make the world a better place, I guess. Um, but I always was, you know, I started organizing at 14, as Kendrick said, um, and I, I was much more of an agitator um, and felt really comfortable in the role of a disturber, um, but didn't really ever see myself as being in the forefront. Um, so becoming an elected politician was never part 
of the plan, I actually didn't like those people very much. <laughs> um, and so I still kind of feel weird when people are like, you're a politician. It just still feels icky right. in a way. Um, and I, I, I reluctantly ended up running for, for office, but my work I always thought was, you know, to, to give back um, to a society that had invested so much in raising and caring for me. Um, and I just thought that was like part of something that you did outside of your actual job. And so I'd always worked, but always organized right. as well. What is your perspective, Kendrick, on radical imagination? Um, well, one, I think that's what makes you such a great leader. That's when you, know, you can tell that you reject a lot of the stereotypes of politicians and the things that make us all feel icky about politics. <laughs> um, and you, know, you have at your center and your core care for, for the people that you love and making this world a better place. And you can just feel that, that when you meet you, you're like thinking you're gonna be like, I'm a fighter, you know, and it's like you're so approachable and grounded and I didn't realize I was messing that part up that <laughs> you just you feel don't have like that at there's all. people this, to think I'm a yeah. fighter. Well, I am a fighter. We you are. Kidding. And I think that it shows us that we all are fighters. We should be fighters that we yeah. no matter who you're a mom first, right? You're a community member first, just like all of us, and we should be able to take on there's there's extraordinary things about you that I think feed into the radical part that, you know, a lot of the time what we're calling radical for people who are dedicated to solutions and making the world better <laughs> um, don't seem very radical. Care is radical in a world that doesn't center care, you know? Um, and so I think radical imagination is a lot of the time daring to venture outside of what's convenient, right? Daring to venture outside of, and that means information. Daring to, to question, daring to, to be curious enough to um, explore those areas that are gray, those areas that, are, that seem dark, that seem like scary, the unknown. Um, picking apart conflicts and understanding what part you took in the harm. Yeah. You know, that's radical a lot of the time, that, that type of accountability and understanding that when I do harm somebody, I have to acknowledge it and be a part of the healing process if they allow me, yeah. right? Um, radical is understanding, you know, when somebody says, what are borders? and being brave enough to say, even if I reject that and say, well, obviously a border is this, you know? And it's like, actually, what, what are they asking? Yeah. And am I gonna take the time and be daring and curious enough um, to explore that and why I reject that automatically, right? Um, so I, I think it's, it's more of an exploration that is usually People are in survival mode, don't have time for. Um, people scare us. I mean, if we really want to get into the history of this country, they scare us out of imagination. They criminalize uh, spirituality. They criminalize healing. They criminalize um, uh, different uh, forms of healing and therapy and um, medicine, right? And then just being melanated black. <laughs> criminalize everything right. but um, but you know I think that 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 the radical part of it um, usually because the connotation what they've made what they've called radical and what they've painted to be radical has been criminalized and demonized demonized as bad violent immoral and negative but radical just means wildly different and if you can't see how much terrible things are happening in this world and how much evil is happening in this world and you you're not committed to making things wildly different than they are then you've been tricked into um being complacent and being a part of that machine that makes things that system that makes things hard for everybody 
And I want to take it, and I, I love that. I think I want to take it back a little Did bit. Did you all not love that? Love that. Oh my God. I think that a lot of times we are all able to dream big dreams and have these visions. It's one thing to one thing to dream, but another to be able to sustain that dream and to sustain that vision. And in order for us to do that, we have to have a healthy thought life. And you know, for me, it is something that I struggle with daily is, is making sure that what I'm thinking is the right thoughts and being active and vigilant with my thoughts and making sure that I'm able to look at the difference between a truth and a lie. The difference between what are my thoughts producing? Is it producing anxiety? Is it producing fear? Or is it producing love? Or is it producing joy? And so I know that we have to have the mental fortitude, the mental endurance to keep our mind in a healthy space so we can have that radical imagination. Ilhan, with the work that you do, with the work that you do, it's a mandate that you pull from a place of vision, that you pull from a place of imagination with creating policy change, with creating social movements. What does your toolbox look like that helps you sustain a healthy radical imagination? Um, I, I think for me, um, you know, the, 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 the big piece to the way in the way I developed my tools was was through my upbringing. Mm. Um, my father and and, and grandfathers um, sort of raised us uh, in in a way that really invested in our internal liberation. They believed we had to be built like a like a structure, like a house. You had to have very solid foundation. You had to know who you were, what you were, what you were made of, what you were capable of, um, and 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 really played out a lot of you know scary scenarios of the world in which we would be going into, um, and constantly pushed us and debated with us to be able to, to bring um, that, that core strength that did not break when it was challenged in ways um, that most people are, are often not prepared to, to withstand. Um, and so I, I tell people all the time, and they're like, you, you don't seem to be upset by criticism. And I was like, I grew up in a house of criticism. <laughs> like, I woke up with criticism. I went to sleep with criticism. So, so thank you, Mom and Dad. Right? Like, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a very debate, like, challenging um, sort of environment to grow up. But it was, a, it was an environment that um, really also made us understood that we were loved in ways that was different. Um, because our parents were showing us that there was a way to love you without the you that is like imaginary, right? Like there's a person, there's a human being in front of you that is, that is developing into, into something and whether you like it or not, yeah. like can they be loved and can you teach them that they can be loved? Wow. Um, and so for me, I was, I was thought that regardless of what I was and who I became, that there was a core group of people that were gonna love me. Mm, that's good. And that I think is, is the tool pot box that I go into this work. Um, mm. And you know, I, I am always the person who's thinking about like, what is not the easy thing to do, but what is the right thing to do? And how do I infuse my thoughts and ideas into a system that really wasn't like built for many of the experiences and identities that, that I've had, that I have, um, a, a system that doesn't even want to me to be visible um, or to create visibility for people um, that, that they don't deem worthy um, of, of the kind of policy changes that, that we're pushing for. And I, I really think like that piece is important because as, as we organize and as we radically reimagine the, the kind of world we want 
um, the kind of world we are living in, the kind of world that we want to create, we have to think about how do we create those building blocks for ourselves and for everyone around us. Because if you are not strong in your core, if you don't have people who are not going to break around you and you're not going to break, then you are able to try to create, I think, um, bricks for everyone else to yeah. be able to build a foundation um, that will create the kind of structure that we want to create in our society. And I, I, I actually like saw that. I was in, in Guatemala um, last year um, with a group of other uh, elected officials and we went to this encampment where this group of families decided to stop um, a transatlantic mining company from Canada um, in exploiting um, their, their water. Um, they got to a point where they would have water an hour every 48 hours. And they decided, you know, 12 families decided that they were going to take 24 hour, 48 hour shifts blocking the road and they sustained themselves for 12 years. Wow. So for 12 years, this Canadian company has not been able to exploit that community, right? So they are fighting against the military of the country. They are fighting, you know, all the might of the government. They are fighting, like, um, concessions that were made and trade policies that allow for this transatlantic company to sue Guatemala yeah. um, because they have a contract that says they can get, you know, mine. And, and I sat there thinking, you know, when um, Jamar Clark was killed in, in my district, we um, occupied uh, a police precinct. We lasted for 18 days. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we didn't last for 18 days and leave just because we wanted to. Um, but it was because many of us did not have the strength to withstand all of the elements of what we were going to deal with, whether it was the weather, <laughs> the criticism, the lack of support, the lack of resources, um, and lack of trust with one, you know, within right. each other. Right. Um, and so, I say all of that to say that if, if we are to engage in, in this work um, authentically and thoughtfully and we are looking for tools within our toolbox, we have to first be thinking about what new tools we have to bring in order to create the kind of world that we want. Wow, that's right there. I wanna stay here for one second and then Kendrick, I wanna hear about your toolbox. With all the work that you do, how do you not partner with fear? Um, I, I, I think, you know, fear obviously exists, but, but I think it can be um, a, a tool to ignite different things in you. That's great. Yeah. Um, like, I use fear to fuel me. Like, I am, I am scared of the world my kids might grow up in if I don't do enough. Yeah. So that fear <laughs> is the reason I get up and I work, you know, and I um, move with, with love and I don't let yeah. myself get burned out because I'm just so driven um, by that fear of what will happen if I am not actively participating. Uh, and, I, and I think oftentimes people think of fear as a crippling thing. Yes. Um, but I, feel like fear can also be a liberating thing. Mm -hmm. And it could be something that like strengthens you. Don't let it use you, you use it. Yes. That's what that is right there. What is in your toolbox, Kendrick? <laughs> um, well, um, I tend to post like thirst trap. <laughs> Don't listen to him, you guys. <laughs> and then draw people into the political part and the activism uh, part. 
toolbox, toolbox, toolbox. <laughs> oh. Your mental toolbox. How, oh, how, oh, got it. How yeah. do you? So I my mental toolbox. Um, I usually post thirst trap. No, I, I'm done, y'all. I'm no, done. I, I, no, I, re- no, I, I, um, I have therapy. Uh, talk therapy, you know, once a week. If I don't, it's noticeable. Um, <laughs> I do my best to meditate every morning. I do my best um, and ground myself. And part of that is a um, visualization exercise. I usually end my meditation with a visualization exercise and I think about the world that I want to see for the people that I love most for, you know, some young uh, kids in my life who are, you know, questioning their gender, questioning their um, sexuality, you know, kids with disabilities, some elder folks in my life, people that are most vulnerable. And I do my best in my life, my, my, you know, people that are very, very close to me and dear to my heart. And I think about the hardships that they face and I do my best to breathe that out. And when I'm thinking about breathing it out, I'm breathing that out of the world, right? I'm like, I don't want that anywhere near them. And I do my best to envision a world for them that is free, that is liberated, that is supportive. Um, Not that they're still healing, but they have healed, they're thriving. And I do my best to remember that my imagination has been colonized. My imagination has been oppressed and suppressed (laughs) um, my entire life. So there's no way that I've dismantled all of that in a couple years, in a few years that I've been, you know, studying black radical, you know, um, politics and stuff. Now I'm decolonized and woke. Um, It can't be. You have to constantly break down the concepts that hinder us from expanding our imagination and thinking of that world and how that world should be and feel, taste, yeah. using all of our senses. And, and I break that down every day and imagine them even freer and freer. And that's usually the thing that drives me. And, and that fear of not having that world, that fear of me not participating now, I always have to tell myself the movement will move without you, <laughs> right? Like, it ain't, don't, you can't feed, you can't let that fear get your ego going. Like, you know, well, if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Um, the movement has been moving before you got here and will keep moving after. It don't need you, but it can definitely use your help. Yes. And, you know, I do my best to keep that in mind and not let that fear get me into a paranoid state of right. an unhealthy uh, state of, of I have to, but at the same time that fear that they won't experience that joy, that they won't experience that freedom if I don't do my part right. and I don't focus on my job and my responsibility in creating a safer world for them, then it might not be realized. Yeah, that's good. And I believe we all have a part to play. Uh, We all, for sure, have a part to play. Switching gears a bit, it is inevitable that we will face opposition and resistance, and I know that both of you deal with that a lot. And when I'm in seasons of opposition and adversity, I kind of liken it into thinking about the trees that are still standing after the thunderstorm. But we're realizing that the, the trees are able to stand. It doesn't mean that they didn't get affected by the storm. It doesn't mean that the leaves didn't fall off, that a, a couple limbs didn't fall off. But what is making them stand is the, the soil that they're in. They are planted in good soil, and their roots are made of something sturdy. And so for me, I have to remind myself when I'm in those seasons of opposition and trial to be rooted in joy, remembering to count it all joy, knowing that the adversity and the trials that come my way are only producing great fruit, which is strength, which is peace, which is joy. So I would love to know what you guys are rooted in that is allowing you to withstand the storms. 
you looking at me Ooh. like you know, I need to go I first. <laughs> I love, I love how they both just go back uh, and forth to each other. Um, you, you could ponder on it, think about it. But. No, I love that analogy. I usually use that as an analogy for abolition. I've always thought mm. in church when they talk about a good seed produces a good tree, yep. produces good fruit, and a bad seed produces a bad tree, produces bad fruit. Yes. And then it says in order to, you got to, Rip up that tree, burn that. Yeah. I mean, that's what it says in the Bible. It does say you got to burn that. That's what it says in the Bible. Um, but, <laughs> you know, and you have to plant good seed in that soil. And I even think about, like, natural processes, natural fires occurring. We have to be very clear about that in California. Natural fires can be healthy for soil. Um, Man-made, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we, we ain't even got to get into that. But um, it, the fire that comes after that, I mean, the soil that comes after that naturally occurring fire is some of the richest soil that you can have. And, That's good. Um, and you have a, you plant a new seed in that soil, a good seed that will produce good tree root. So um, I just went to, I, and I know Tia in here like, shut up, man, about this baobab tree. Uh, but I, I went to uh, Senegal, and they talked about the griots, and I got like super excited about the griots, which are the West African storytellers that protect our stories and our history. And they said that they, they re revered them so much that they would bury them not in the ground because they felt like our stories and our history would be buried with them, that they they would lay them to rest in a baobab tree. And the baobab tree was, is like big as a house. Like they have these huge, huge people. There were myths that witches lived in them and things and, and um, medicine people. And that they would lay, in, out of reverence, they would lay them to rest in the baobab tree. And the history of the baobab tree is it can survive the harshest conditions. It still produces fruit because its roots are so deep and it's so big. So even in the harshest conditions with no water, it still ha is nourished. It still is nourished and will stand the test of time and will outlive most people, <laughs> all people, <laughs> if, it, if it does what it's supposed to do, if it's planted well and uh, nourished properly. Um, and so just thinking about that and thinking about, I, t I think about that a lot and think about roots and I'm a country bumpkin, you know, I grew up very in the soil, all right? So it gets me excited to think about planting and the analogy for a healthy environment um, and applying that to life. Um, but the baobab tree took it a much further step for me in even thinking about just not being planted strong and rooted in um, good values of peace and love and care and liberation um, um, and accountability <laughs> um, and power and those, 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 those uh, values that you're rooted in. Um, but it also is you should be so deeply rooted that even in those, those hard times, not just the storms, but in the dry season, that's you know, good. and those things, you can yeah. still produce Come on. good fruit. Yes. You know, that's pretty, yes. that, that was powerful to me. It pierced through to my soul. So, you know, the griots, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's actually very, very good. Because I feel like a lot of times when we are in those seasons of dry seasons, if you will, we need those seasons in order to be able to do the next seasons that we're called to. We need to be able to be able to be before we do. And a lot of times we get that completely uh, opposite. So Ilhan, with you, when those storms come, when you constantly are getting resistance, when you're constantly, people are saying, you shouldn't be here, you're not qualified for this job. When you ask for a policy change and they say no, or you constantly are knocking on doors just to advocate for change, what are you rooted in? I'm rooted in this, in this sort of, um, I think, similar, uh, you know, uh, idea of, 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 you know, changing of, of times. Um, you know, I, I vividly remember as a um, a young person living in in the refugee camp. I, you know, it was it was tough times, um, and my my dad would always say, you know, Ohan, remember your today doesn't determine your tomorrow. Mm. Um, and and I think there's there's something beautiful about knowing that you know the the sun goes down and it rises. 
um, that whatever it is we might be going through today might not be what we are going through tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The person who says no today might say yes tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, these policies that are looked at as not possible might be possible tomorrow. Um, you know, I think about, I've been fighting for universal school meals. I, it was one of the first bills I introduced when I was in the Minnesota House, and it just got passed by the Minnesota legislature. It's implemented as law. You know, I am not there, obviously. Um, I didn't get the opportunity to vote for it and, and author the bill, but it is the seeds that, that we helped plant that have now allowed, right? Everybody thought we were crazy to be thinking about that. I think about things like student debt cancellation. When I first came to Congress, Bernie Sanders and I, that was our first bill. Um, and everybody was like, what is wrong with you people? Like, this is never going to happen. And then we now have a very moderate president who's like, oh, I'll think about canceling this much. Um, and so there, there are um, those sort of moments that you know, remind you um, that the tough times today might not be, um, might be the, the joyous days of tomorrow. Yeah. Ooh, that right there. Um, as we know, oh, okay, wow, we have to wrap it up very soon already? Wow, oh no. Um, as we know, just like you're talking about your dark experiences, I think a lot of times we don't realize that their strategies and all of our strategies should be to be at a place to spread love, to be at a place to spread joy, to be at a place to spread peace, and to spread light and to be a light. And Kendrick, you're a light. Can you elucidate to me some of your dark experiences in your childhood that led you to radical love for the marginalized? Hey, man. Hey. Well, <laughs> my childhood was a rough one. Um, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of those experiences. You know, I, 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 speaking of light, and, and, and I'm drawn to the dark. I love the dark. I love nighttime. I love, you know, I'm a nocturnal person. I like, you know, I like dark movies. I like dark humor. Um, and a lot of the stuff I experienced, even though I was like devastated at the time, I find hilarious now. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll give this, I'll give this one. This is, if I'm laughing, I, I, I'm traumatized. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, but I did. You gotta laugh through the pain. <laughs> you gotta laugh <laughs> through say. the pain. Um, Thank God for those times, though, because you're here now. You're here today. You're using it for good. Yeah, they kicked out. So they, when I got to high school, we had a step team. You had to, in order to be in the step team, you had to go to ROTC. They had already done the damage before I got there. You had to be in junior ROTC um, because they said, at the time, they, I don't know, you know, in the South, you have fraternities and sororities, black fraternities and sororities at step in high school. Um, and we wanted that at our school, but it was a predominantly white school with a healthy black population that they were trying to make unhealthy. And um, they made us, if we wanted to be in step team, because they said that step teams were gangs, um, we had to operate in junior ROTC. Now, they also said that we can't, because we're so dangerous, we can't dance gratuitously. And at one point, we had a, a step that was like, that at the end, you know, you get a little booty pop, a little boop. I told Michael I wouldn't twerk on stage, but I did it anyway. Um, but I did a little poop. I did a little poop. They kicked the step team out. That was the final straw. Final straw. We're dangerous. Um, and so I had to come to school. And when I tell you I love the night so much that I don't sleep during the night. So early up in the morning, 6.30, we supposed to be, 6.30 a.m., we supposed to be at school. I had to wake up. I hate waking up in the morning. I'm not a morning person, I'm an evil person. Abolitionist stuff goes out the window. I am not an activist in the morning. I am not a good person. 
Um, but I went out of my way to wake up and be to school by 5.30 every day to try to petition the teachers to put a, a step team, a co-ed step team together wow. outside of ROTC because I thought it was so racist that they canceled it. I would drive 45 minutes up to the north side of Houston to this other school that had an incredible step team that was academically excellent and all this other mess um, that we have to be put through in order just to have culture. Um, and ask them to come to our school and speak to the teachers and try to find a sponsor and to get people to sign petitions. That, um, I, I eventually didn't get any of that approved and started a, a step team outside and we were terrible, we were awful, but we had each other. Um, it was led by a crip. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be real with you. Um, and we had a fantastic time. We learned all these steps, we danced, we entered uh, step shows, we failed. Um, <laughs> we lost um, every time. Um, but like for real, for real, it taught me because we were literally just a bunch of, the people that joined it were people that weren't afraid of going up against the school. And we were just like a little group of misfits that banded together and were like, I mean, when we lost, we were like, we got in the step show. Like, it was amazing. Like, this was, the, do you know what we went through to get here? And I feel like that experience in dealing with small organizations and building community now through Build Power and the stuff yep. that we've done, that was just practice for it. Mm. Because I love nothing better, even if we don't uh, complete a campaign, even if we don't win a policy, even if we don't, you know, do get the goal that we were fighting for, the fight along there and the people that you build and the community that you build um, on those values and the radical folks that you meet along the way that expand your imagination. And that type of community is the strongest community. That's, That's the community that grounds me. That's the community. I love being my misfit self, my weird self with all my little misfit weird homies um, and I did I, I really do think and that when I tell you I was crying and shit when when I was a kid because of that experience it was traumatizing it was yeah. racist as hell but I find it hilarious now because it did teach me a lot of the tools that I use now Ooh, um, in my that's good that's indicative of nothing is wasted nothing is wasted as we close what is one action item that you would implore us to do to make a difference in our spheres? That feels big. <laughs> <laughs> um, check in with you. That's great. Um, there, you know, I think in those quiet moments, um, there, there probably will be something burning in you. Um, that doesn't feel right about your workplace, about um, your personal life, your family's life, your community, um, society at large. And once you identify that thing, fight to change it um, because it does multiply. You know, I think you know the the the, the small story of trying to get your step team um, has has let Kendrick to see the bigger picture and all of the other changes that he can fight for and implore others to. And I think oftentimes we don't see there are small things that need to be changed in our own lives, in our own communities before we can even think about like bigger structural things that we should be fighting for. And once we are grounded in that, then we're unshakable, right? Then we, we understand like, yes, a setback is supposed to happen because it happened that small thing, yeah. right? Yes, mistrust is supposed to happen because it happened at that small thing we were fighting for. Um, yes, people are going to throw everything at us because they were doing that, you know, when we were trying to get a step team. <laughs> um, of course, they're not going to let us, you know, have a, a justice system that, like, works for everyone because they wouldn't even let us have a step team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so I think once you start to, like, see um, that there, that there is uh, an, an opportunity for you to, to learn from these small changes that you're making, um, I think we will collectively be stronger yeah. um, and better and bigger. Wow. 
That's beautiful. Thank you both for being here, taking the time out to talk, to chat. You both are extraordinary and we need you guys. So thank you, we got you, we got you guys covered, lifted and keep on doing the good work and the good trouble. Thank you. Thank Ilhan you. Omar and Kendrick Sampson. Give it up for Natalie. Thank you guys.